chapter 1, verses 25 and 26, read, convinced of this, I know that I will remain, and I will continue with you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you, your joy in Christ Jesus will overflow on account of me. The word of the Lord. Two weeks ago, we started a sermon series on the fruit of the Spirit and how that applies to us today. This fruit of the Spirit, I'm sure you may be familiar, comes from Galatians 5 and includes nine attributes of the fruit of the Spirit. But last week, or two weeks ago, Nick started us off by sharing how even though we have these nine attributes, they are inextricably tied together into a singular fruit of the Spirit. They're all essential parts of God's life worked out in us and around us through the Spirit. And we can have confidence that the Spirit doesn't give only one or only another but all nine together in everything that the Spirit leads. In the Spirit, there's no love without joy. There's no joy without peace. There's no peace without patience, and so on. Last week, Todd explored the first of the nine attributes, which is love. And he concluded that love becomes part of our lives, not as we conjure it up or create it ourselves, but as God makes it available. And this fruit, of which love is a partial description, a component, is not ours to generate, but is a human response to the story of the gospel and a supernatural enabling of the gospel in the present. So it's my privilege to be here with you this morning, continuing this discussion of the fruit of the Spirit and moving us into the second of the nine attributes of the fruit of the Spirit, which is joy. And the question that I have for us today is why is it that joy even shows up on this list at all? Why is joy an essential part of the fruit of the Spirit, essential enough to make it onto this list of love and peace and patience. And particularly in the context of so many other, perhaps more traditional, socially impactful virtues that we see, like love and peace and goodness and gentleness, why is joy on this list? Why is joy a defining virtue of life with the Holy Spirit? And if we take it a step further and think of the fruit of the Spirit and life in the Spirit as the gospel itself, we can clarify this question and ask, why is joy essential to the gospel? And I think this is a really important question for us today. We have a lot of modern stresses in our lives, a lot of uh, distance, a lot of division, uncertainty, a lot of kind of general callousness in our culture. So much so that it can seem like a huge leap of faith just to let yourself feel joy in the midst of all this around us. And if you add on to that the unhelpful theologies of shame that perpetuate this idea that we have to show remorse and we have to go through a period of mourning every time we sin to show that we're truly repentant, it can almost become harder to experience joy in the church than outside of the church. Because we have this idea that if we're too joyful, maybe we're not recognizing the gravity of our sin. 
Maybe we're not fully repentant. But then at the same time, I'm sure you've all met the really happy Christian, the one that is just so excited about their life and their faith and so inspired that just being around them almost makes you feel guilty. Like the joy that you do experience isn't sufficient. You don't have the kind of joy that they have. And that results in you feeling bad about your own spiritual life. And so you get into a cycle of feeling, on one hand, that you shouldn't feel the joy that you have because of everything going on around you, because of your own sin and just the situation we're in. And then on the other hand, feeling that you're not feeling enough joy. And you can just get in this cycle of too much joy, not enough joy, feeling bad about not having enough joy. And so I think now more than ever, it is vital that we understand that joy is an essential part of the gospel. As Paul says in Galatians, and as comes out in Philippians that we're looking at today. Joy is a defining part of the gospel, and it's a part that is ours, that is available to us, and in fact necessary as, as one of these nine attributes to experiencing the full gospel in our lives and demonstrating it to the world. And so it requires, in this context, a leap of faith, and yet it also requires something a little more grounded than a leap of faith. But what is that? So these are some of the questions that I want to explore today, all focused around this one question of why is joy a defining virtue of life with the Spirit? Why is joy absolutely essential to the gospel? And what do I need to do in order to feel it? To answer this question, let's look at the text. The key passage today, Philippians 1, verses 25 through 26, says, Convinced of this, I know that I will remain, and I'll continue with you, with all of you, for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you, your joy in Christ Jesus will overflow on account of me. So before we look into that verse a little bit more, I just want to give a little foundation for Philippians and for where this verse comes in. The letter of Paul to the Philippians has one of the least disputed authorships in the New Testament. It's seen as the quintessential Pauline letter. It was probably written around 56 CE from Ephesus, from prison. But it could have been written a few years later when Paul was in Rome, also in prison. He spent a good bit of time there. <laughs> um, but regardless, it was to the people in Philippi, where Paul had visited earlier and had helped start a church. Now, the city of Philippi has a really rich, fascinating history. Philippi is located in eastern Greece, um, this way for you. Um, right along what's called the Via Ignatia, which is like a main road going from Rome, connecting Rome to the rest of the Roman Empire in the east. It was named after Philip II, or in Roman numerals, Philip II, which I think is funny because it sounds a lot like Philippi, um, who was the father of Alexander the Great. So this was several hundred years earlier. But Philippi was a Roman colony, which means that it was actually largely the land there was given to retired Roman soldiers. And so mo most of the population was made up of retired Roman soldiers. Latin was the official language. Greek was also spoken there. Um, and Roman law applied, particularly Roman law that would apply in Italy, also applied here in this colony in Greece. And that might be why Paul's mistreatment while he was in Philippi was taken so seriously. Um, one other interesting point about Philippi is that in the 40s BCE, so almost 100 years before Paul visited and wrote the letter, Mark Antony, 
and Octavian chased down the assassins of Julius Caesar, where we get the Ides of March from, chased down the assassins, Cassius and Brutus, caught them at Philippi and defeated them there. So this was a place with history, it was a significant place, had a lot of rich Roman culture. And so Paul visited here in 50 CE on his second missionary journey through the Mediterranean. Another interesting thing about the church in Philippi is that women played a really prominent role. We see the story of Lydia, one of the first people that Paul and Silas met when they visited the city. They went down to a river where a group of women were gathered and they started talking with them there. Lydia was one of the first to believe and her family as well. And she became the host for Paul and Silas while they lived in Philippi. She invited them into their home and that's where they stayed. Another woman that plays a significant role in the story of Paul and Philippi is a slave girl who had some sort of spirit and she was following them around the whole time they were there preaching, say, say, saying things about them, right? Prophesying that they're talking about Jesus of Nazareth and, and all sorts of things. And apparently it was distracting to them, so they cast out the spirit. Um, this got people angry and, and they ended up being thrown into jail. Um, and then we have the whole story of the earthquake in prison, everyone breaking loose but staying there. The, the jailer about to kill himself until he realizes that, oh, everyone's still here. And then the whole jailer's family being uh, converted. One other pair of women that we see in Philippians is uh, actually within the text, Philippians 4, we see Paul addressing Euodia and Syntyche uh, and asking them to come to agreement. And the way he does this is he introduces this concept of rejoicing in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. That, that, that famous passage uh, that's in the song. Um, and so women, is a, women are a prominent, uh, play a prominent role in the church. Um, so anyways, all of these stories, prison, uh, all of these things, Paul had a turbulent time while he was in Philippi, but it also seemed that he became really close to the church in Philippi, living with them. And we see this also in the passage. In Philippians 1 verse 8, Paul is writing to them and he says, I long for all of you with the affection of Jesus Christ. And it wasn't just one way. The Philippians also distinguished their appreciation and love for Paul by being one of the only congregations, the only one at that time, that actually sent money to Paul after he left to support his ministry in other cities. So there was a mutual connection between Paul and the church in Philippi. They were close. And this closeness is evident in the, the language that uh, is used in Philippians. And it's so clear, so evident, that many scholars actually think of the book of Philippians as an example of the rhetoric of friendship. It falls within this whole rhetorical style of a letter that you would write to a friend. So looking at the text, we see that friendship, relationship, connection is a huge theme. We see that Paul and the Philippians knew each other well and they were close, they had been through a lot together. But that still doesn't totally answer the question, why is joy essential to the gospel? Why does joy show up in that list of nine attributes, along with love and peace and kindness and goodness and things like that? So let's look at the passage now and the context around the passage and see if that helps us out. We see uh, in Philippians another theme. In addition to friendship and relationship and connection, we see a theme of joy. Joy both in the face of hardship, as Paul is writing from prison, as Paul has experienced prison in Philippi, and as the Philippians themselves are facing difficulty. So it's joy in the face of hardship. It's also joy in relationship. We see the centrality of friendship, and the word joy and rejoice appears 13 times 
in just four short chapters that make up the book. That also doesn't even include similar words, cognate synonyms like glad and cheer and exult, other things like gratitude and glory. We have a lot of language related to joy in this book. So the book starts out in verse 1 with greetings from Paul and Timothy. It says, sorry, <laughs> with greetings. It says, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus. I think this stands out also because if you look at most of the epistles and letters from Paul, you'll see sometimes it's only Paul writing, sometimes it's Paul and another person, he'll name someone else, but almost every time when there are two people, it starts with Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, or something like that, and Timothy or whoever he's writing with. In this one, interestingly, he cuts out that little, uh, that little uh, title, and he just says, Paul and Timothy. It's an egalitarian opening. And that might be because his relationship with the Philippians was so rich, so close. He didn't feel the need to justify his authority or to prove his place so that they would listen to him. They were already paying attention. So the beginning of chapter 1 continues as an affectionate greeting between Paul and the Philippian church. Paul thanks God for them. Paul writes about how he prays with joy about them. And he expresses confidence in them as partners in the gospel. Paul then talks about his current prison experience, the total comfort he takes from the Holy Spirit. We see that famous to live is Christ and to die is gain passage where Paul just illustrates his total joy, his total peace with God in whatever situation. And it's in that context that we come across verses 25 and 26, which say, convinced of this, I know that I will remain, and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you again, your joy in Christ Jesus will overflow on account of me. These verses come in the context of a book that's just steeped in friendship and joy. We know from their history that the Paul, Paul and the Philippians were close. We know they had been through a lot. We know from within the letter, all throughout it, but starkly in this verse that we just read, the centrality of joy to Paul's relationship with the Philippians and to Paul's work itself. Paul says that joy is the very reason he does what he does. And it's the reason that, well, when he comes to them, his presence will initiate that joy in them. So this brings us back one more time to the question, what does this tell us about how joy is an essential part of the gospel? So in the passage, we find two strong statements. The first statement the reason Paul expects to continue his work is so that the Philippians will progress and experience joy in their faith. In other words, joy is the reason Paul is working as he is. And that seems really basic, right? But I think it does offer some weight to an argument for joy. If you find yourself in a place where you don't feel right about the joy that's inside of you, you don't feel like you deserve to express it or that the circumstances warrant you to express it. Just knowing how central Paul makes joy to his work ought to provide some confidence to you, something to hang on to justify your joy if you don't feel like you can do it yourself. And so... The first thought that I have in response to this is that you can feel joy in this moment because Paul made it central to the gospel message. He centered his work all around joy. And we have this entire book of Philippians to stand by that fact, even if we don't understand exactly why joy is so important. 
So that's something to hang on to, but that still doesn't answer the question of why is joy essential to the gospel? Why does joy show up as one of the nine attributes of the fruit of the Spirit? And why, in Philippians, does Paul make joy so central to everything that he's doing? I think this becomes a lot clearer in the second verse, verse 26, which states, so that through my being with you again, your joy in Christ Jesus will overflow on account of me. I think this is really deep. Paul is saying that their joy in Christ comes from Paul being with them again. How does this make sense? What is it about Paul being with the Philippians that would drive them to joy, that would be their motivating force for joy? Dr. Lori Santos is a professor at Yale who teaches a class on the science of happiness. This class has become the most popular class in the history of Yale, booking out the largest auditoriums on campus semester after semester. In a recent interview, Dr. Santos stated that we know that pretty much anywhere you go in the world, so that's, that's regardless of culture, language, pretty much anywhere you go in the world, people who are more socially connected, people who interact and intentionally spend time with their friends and family members, they wind up happier. According to Dr. Santos, there is a clear link between social connection and happiness. Another scholar in the field, Brene Brown, in Atlas of the Heart, says something about this as well. Brown defines joy as an intense feeling of deep spiritual connection. Also pleasure and appreciation. But I want to focus on spiritual connection. She goes deeper, describing the differences between joy and happiness. Happiness, for Brene, is stable, longer lasting, and normally the result of effort. It's lower in intensity than joy, and it's more self-focused. With happiness, we feel a sense of being in control. Unlike joy, which is more internal, happiness seems more external and circumstantial. Joy, on the other hand, according to Brene, is sudden. It's unexpected. It's short-lasting, and it's high intensity. It's characterized by a connection with others or with God, nature, or the universe. Joy expands our thinking and our attention, and it fills us with a sense of freedom and abandonment. It makes me think of Paul's statement to live as Christ and to die as gain. So both from Paul's letter to the Philippians and from contemporary scholarship on joy, we're starting to see that connection is inherent to joy. In fact, joy comes in and through satisfying spiritual connection, deep spiritual connection. Joy is essential to the gospel because joy hinges on the one thing that drives all of the Christian gospel, and that is relationship. Joy isn't just a good feeling that comes from spiritual connection. Joy is spiritual connection. It's true, soul-bearing understanding of someone else and knowing that they understand you at your core. Joy is knowing someone and being known by them. This point was reinforced to me last night as I was scrolling through Instagram. I came across a video from Ty Gibson, a pastor and speaker based out in Oregon, saying this. Are you bummed? Are you stressed? Are you pressed? Are you angry? Are you fed up? Are you freaked out? The fastest way to feel better is to tell Jesus about all of it out loud. The second fastest way to feel better is to find something good to do to someone, for someone else. 
And the third fastest way to feel better is to find something to laugh your head off about with someone you love. Now, these are great ideas of things to do to start feeling better when you're down. But the reason that this really stood out to me is that every single one of Ty Gibson's solutions to this problem were centered around spiritual connection. And when I say spiritual here, I mean on one hand, interacting with divinity, but I also mean the simple definition of having to do with the human spirit, the soul, who a person really is. And so telling Jesus the things that are worrying you is bearing your soul. And in that sense, it is both spiritual as an interaction with the divine and as dealing with your genuine self. Finding something good to do for someone else is again a spiritual connection in that it involves opening yourself up to the spirit of the other person, becoming aware of what good they really need at this time, and then participating in that. It might not involve vulnerability on your part, but it opens you up to the vulnerability of someone else. And in that, spiritual connection is formed. And the last example, laughing your head off with someone you love, is perhaps the most obvious example of joy as spiritual connection because it involves openness on the part of both parties. And it's an openness about something pleasant. So the spiritual connection is happening, the happy emotions are being expressed, and this connection is joy. So my point here is that joy is not the result of these spiritual connections. Joy, rather, is the spiritual connection. That is what distinguishes joy from happiness. That's what grounds joy. This is how we can ground our own joy and make sure it isn't code for some kind of blind submission to uniformity at the expense of our own authenticity. We can clarify that even unity isn't so much about agreement as it is about mutual understanding of each other and in that connection. And this is why Paul centered his work around joy. When Paul says he's working for their progress and joy in the faith, he is saying that he is working to nurture spiritual connection among them that they can appreciate and enjoy. That's why joy is essential to the gospel. The gospel is healthy relationship among people and God. It's embodied for all of us to see in the life, the death, and the resurrection of Christ. And joy is the spiritual experience of that relationship, complete with all of the inherent emotion and pleasure, plus more. And so I think this reveals what all of those problems I mentioned at the beginning of this message were really about. The division, the uncertainty, the callousness, that we see around us, all of the dominant stressors in society today come from a failure of connection, a failure of deep connection on the level of our spirits. The reason it takes a leap of faith to feel joy is because we've deprioritized relationships so much that they no longer stand on their own merit. We need justifiable economic reasons to prop them up. The shame-based theologies all around us come from our resistance to connection on a spiritual level. We'd rather hide who we really are or compensate for it by putting on a show of remorse than to be honest with ourselves, our own faults and strengths, and with others, and with God, and to move forward in that vulnerability with joy. So even the feelings we encounter when we're surrounded by happy people. Feelings of guilt that our lives don't measure up to another's joy come from a lack of connection on a deep level with those other people. If we really knew them, we'd know the reasons for their joy, maybe also the reasons for why they express their joy the way they do. 
And we'd also know the ups and downs of their lives. And that knowledge would destroy the unhealthy comparison that drives us to feel bad about our own experience of joy. If joy is the experience of deep, healthy relationship with God and with other people, then that means the pursuit of joy is better focused, not on achieving a feeling, but on finding a connection. In Christ, we find the ultimate facilitator for this connection. By his very nature, which is fully human and fully divine, Christ embodies spiritual connection. Christ came to earth for the purpose of forging a connection with us. And when he was killed, resurrected and ascended, he sent the Holy Spirit to take his place. And still now, we have the potential to be just as close to God, just as connected to God, as when Christ was on earth. As we pursue this connection, we experience joy. Not as a result, separate from the connection, but as a very part of the connection. And this also means we have a facilitator for our relationships with each other. Christ provides the foundation, the staging ground, for real connection among us. I don't know about you, but every deeply loving relationship I've experienced has reminded me of God. And often, a mutual relationship with God has been the enabler for my spiritual connection with another person. You can experience joy, real joy, grounded joy, joy as spiritual connection, joy that exposes manipulative calls for unity at the expense of authenticity, joy that confronts restrictive happiness and that resists shame-based theology. You can experience joy if you will only allow yourself to connect safely and as you really are with God and with one another. And if you do this, you will contribute to the joy of others as well. Because the connection that brings you joy will bring joy to them, the one you are connected with as well. And so at Advent Hope, as we continue working toward our mutual joy as a community, we may just find that we have created a community not only of joy, but also of love and peace and patience, the fruit of this spirit complete.